Does it camel the legal cause why judgment should not now be imposed? No, Your Honor. The record reflect that I have read and considered a 13-page probation officer's report dated March the 28th, 2017 by Ms. Herrera. I have received numerous uh, letters from uh, family and friends uh, from both sides. In addition, Mr. Campbell uh, submitted a lengthy rec uh, letter from Mr. Hearn uh, that I did have the opportunity to read uh, this morning. Uh, Mr. Campbell, uh, anything that you've uh, given me in addition to that, sir? No, you are. Mr. Smith? No, you are. Oh. Mr. Smith, uh, my understanding is, is that uh, you wish to have some of the family members uh, speak to the court this morning? Yes, Your Honor, just one. Please. Ma'am, come on up to the podium for me. Do you tell me your name and spell your last name for the record? My name is Chris Wilson. W-I-L-S-O-N. All right. Go ahead, Ms. Wilson. Thank you. The last three years have been a roller coaster ride of emotions. It's normal to lose someone. But it's not normal to have someone taken from you at the hands of another human being. There's been tears of sadness, tears of pain, tears of anger, followed by a bittersweetness of justice. The pain of hurt has diminished with the honesty and admission of guilt from Mr. Hearn. We do not struggle with Mr. Hearn's plea guilt. He has spoke and testified to the truth, and that has brought accountability to all parties involved. Through all of these emotions, I have come to a place of forgiveness for Mr. Hearn. Forgiving is not okay in the actions of Mr. Hearn. I will never forget, but I will heal through forgiveness and the justice that has been served to our brother. Thank you. Mr. Smith, Mr. Campbell, I understand that uh, Mr. Hearn wishes to address the court and the family? That's correct, Your Honor. If you'd like to address uh, both, he would start with the family. So with the permission of the court, he would uh, not be directing his comments directly to the bench at first, but then he has some comments for the court. That's fine, counsel. Go ahead. Okay. Can you move that microphone closer so we can? Uh, yeah. Would it be all right if he stands with the court? I have sinned. I am guilty of choices that have torn awful wounds in many hearts, rippling destructively through so many precious lives. I have fallen terribly short of the standards of Jesus who commands to serve each other, to be humble, and to love one another. I have evoked God's name and yet behaved exactly opposite of his dictates. I have sinned. I am aware that for my crimes, anything short of death is really merciful. Yet for my sin, I truly do deserve much worse. I have wept and struggled searching for adequate words to express my repentance. It seems like saying I'm sorry to you all will never be enough. And so speaking on, on borrowed and undeserved breath, I offer you my broken-hearted and genuine apology, knowing that it cannot compare to the grief that I've caused all of you. To Robert's family and his dear friends, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for stealing your brother, your friend, your beloved relative, and taking your joy from you. I'm sorry for stealing and killing and destroying, for my senseless anger, for my blind violence, and for being so dismissive of Robert's marriage and his life. I'm sorry for the effects of my pride and lust and anger. 
I'm sorry for the effects that these have caused you in terms of pain and sorrow, tears, frustration, despair, and heartbreak. I'm sorry for my inexcusable involvement with Robert's wife for several years, for being involved in a position I, I should have never been in, for entertaining such cruel opinions of him, for seeing things through the biased and critical lens of bitterness, informed by a perspective that I should have never allowed. And that culminated in such cruelty and has cost you all really incredibly. I'm sorry for the grief that I caused to Robert's mother that broke her heart. To the two children whose dad I took away from them. I'm so sorry. My own choices have destroyed your childhood, devastated your family, complicated and, and impeded your future, and scarred your precious young soul. I've dismantled your home and severely hurt your hearts, and I'm sorry. The pain that you experience is the direct result of my moral compromise, my lusts unchecked, my lack of integrity, my shameful disgrace, and my lost condition in sin and selfishness. I only say these things to apologize for my own role in this cruelty. And as I ask for forgiveness, I realize that it's costlier than I can fathom. I have caused rifts and divides between families. I have taken every future plan and moment that you planned to spend with Robert and left so many brokenhearted, angry, and stolen from me. I cannot deserve your forgiveness. It's far too costly for a thief to deserve it. And forgiveness is so much to ask for a person who has shown so little to others. I'm humbly asking for more than I can even imagine. I do humbly ask for your forgiveness. And uh, Ms. Chris Wilson, thank you so much for extending your amazing forgiveness to me. That's serves as a wonderful example to me. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, I do have some comments for the court. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to uh, apologize to Robert's family and to address the court, to express my utter remorse for my choices. The mercy that I've been shown is not lost on me. Even uh, isolation and misery is a generous portion of real estate for someone of my offenses who's run afoul of every tenet of organized and compassionate society. Your Honor, I, I consider the profound impact of my decisions and I realize that there are many others whose lives are affected and whom I owe heartfelt apology to. I hope for the, the opportunity to repent to each of these in time. I have been told that this hearing is not a forum for direct or personal apologies, but rather a time to specifically address the court. However, if and when I'm afforded the chance to communicate individually with those I've impacted, I will uh, definitely be expressing my sincere apologies uh, first to my own family, friends, and uh, parents. The devastation of my sin has dealt to each of them, I'm sorry, the devastation that my sins have dealt each of them is compounded by the fact that my selfishness has squandered the investments that they have contributed to my life. I was once made successful, held high on the shoulders of those who entrusted me with their love. I not only wounded them by my immorality, but slighted their generosity by my foolishness. I reproached their love, and I'm sorry. Your Honor, I've also wronged Sabrina in the years that I spent with her. I offered her flattery when I should have upheld moral boundary. I gave her my weaknesses rather than my strengths. I entertained the rationale that made excuses for adultery rather than recognizing its perilous effects on her family and marriage. I contributed to her weakness, tolerating my own vacillating morality, 
and I'm sorry for making it so easy for her to abandon love. Your Honor, I've offended Sabrina's parents, her family, and her friends. The nature of our relationship, Sabrina's and my relationship, that is, uh, inter uh, by the nature of that relationship, I intruded unwelcome into their lives, caused them unbearable pain, grief, and heartache, and took so much from their entire family and from all who do genuinely love Sabrina, and I'm sorry for that. There were many other lives indisputably touched by my evil choices. Like ripples on the face of a pond from the falling of a single rock, my fault has reached far beyond those obviously nearest to this situation. The many others include uh, members of the church, those who have borne the blow that my behavior has dealt it, which is a defrauding of the name of those who genuinely do walk in faith rather than use grace as a means of hiding deceit and malice like I did. Uh, my former co-workers and all of women and men who, who faithfully donned the cloth of public service, my personal decisions have been a disgrace to their service, and I'm sorry. All of my teachers, advisors, familiar faces, and counselors, uh, my sin is a reproach to their selfless investments in me, to my many students, explorers, medical students, fire cadets, those I taught who eagerly sought my advice, the years that I spent passionately instructing them are exponentially subtracted by the fissures that I allowed in my own antiquity. My life has become the syllabus of a tragic lesson thus far. Your Honor, there are still others, the judges, the jurors, the attorneys, investigators, court staff, journalists, reporters, all of these who've been exposed to my evil while trying to sort through it and make sense of it, each one touched by my wrongdoing in ways perhaps yet untold. There are also many, many women who I've been less than a gentleman with in my past romantic dealings, flatteries, and heartbreaks. Many who in my lack of honor with are at once unrelated to and yet completely related to this case in terms of my lack of morality. Also, there are others, Your Honor, who I, I may not be provided another avenue to apologize to, yet whom I have dishonored by my brutality. Lawmakers and enforcers forced to respond to my treachery. The communities and counties where I lived, worked, and perpetrated this evil. The state of California, which I have marred by my violence. This great country that I have defaced with far more than just a crime statistic number, and this world that I have burdened with the staggering weight of blood and infringement. To all of the individuals and places affected by my sin, I am sorry, and I seek their forgiveness. Your Honor, there is a profoundly complex multiplicity to this case that a few weeks long trial likely only began to dig beneath the surface of. Hopefully uh, without sounding too ethereal or detached from the very real impacts of my choices, uh, I can offer you a, a brief assessment of the nature of my offenses in this year's long affair. My sins are all ultimately an affront and an offense to God because he who has chosen to suffer, he has chosen to suffer with all who suffer, my victims here, and to acquaint himself with the sorrow and the heartache of all who suffer. My offense against all of you is in truth ultimately against he who suffers with you, because he has written the standards of morality. My crimes and sins are against him as defiance against the truth of love that God has universally imprinted on human hearts. He calls for love as the highest order of law, and for Christians to be humble and serve the needs and interests of others. My sin was so much about me. He denounces every instance of bitterness or seeking one's own vengeance 
I was headstrong in ignoring God's laws of love and peace to obstinately, overzealously address a matter that I had no business in at all. I was willing to kill, to feel loved, affirmed, and accepted, yet that was already provided for me, freely offered elsewhere by a gracious and attentive God who would never have condoned my avarice. I am without excuse, only repentance and remorse. Yet it's been a process to arrive at this understanding. See, in the months, in the three months after my crime and before my arrest, I struggled under the weight of guilt, but I did not really acknowledge my sin. In the hours of wiretaps, we heard my cringeworthy attempts to spiritualize wrongdoing. Those prayers and those shady hopes of evading accountability were the natural outcome of years spent justifying and excusing sin while professing some sort of acquaintance with God. Even the attempts at cleaning up the priorities of our lives was a denial of the need to say sorry, to see sin as wrong, as if displays of devotion and reform could be adequate substitutes for genuine repentance or could somehow demand that God overlook our sins. Of course, that is manipulation of the grace which results from acknowledging and confessing sin. Since then I've read in 1 John 1 and 2, is speaking directly to this condition, he who says that I know Christ and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If we say we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. The mutiny of my own self-deception had me making out making God out to be a liar. If you, can if you can imagine a blind soul with no concept of sight, that was the condition of my heart at the time of my arrest. Lost and stumbling in the illusion I had created. My perception of truth had been reshaped for years to accommodate my sin, adultery, and frustrations with wrong. I had to be shattered. Before I could even begin to comprehend the truth. A crisis resulting in desperate searching for truth. A defining encounter. About four days after my arrest, God induced me to face the truth. It meant conflict between the self-justifying reality that I have constructed and the one that endures eternally. There, broken and stripped of everything, God led me to repentance. It was only as I confessed and acknowledged my sin that I was shown forgiveness and grace. It is written that God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It was that assurance of love, Your Honor, that grace and forgiveness as I knelt there crying and shivering in that jail cell three years ago, they compelled me to speak truth. I apologize for the years of waiting. While I mentioned that I uh, desired to speak truth at that time three years ago, uh, counsel felt obligated to uphold some very nuanced legalities, especially as I was facing the death penalty then. If I had been honest from the beginning, this delay wouldn't have been necessary, so I'm sorry to the court and sorry to all of you for these years of waiting. When I received this sentence, just beyond those doors is a cold and discouraging chamber of captivity, bondage, despair, and hopelessness. It is there that I will be a light, though, not of myself or of my own will, but of Christ and his love the one who has delivered me from the power of darkness and into his marvelous light, who has paid the costliest price of our reconciliation. I recognize that if I had not been caught, I likely would not have ever been found. So to that end, I'm thankful for each and every person who's contributed to my capture and my prosecution. They have been used as instruments in relieving my conscience of a weighty burden that I can't imagine 
I would have endured well for the rest of my life. Those pastors, chaplains, guards, strangers, friends, saints, angels, all of whom have written me, visited me, prayed for me, loved me, forgiven or extended grace to me, has prayed for my victims' families, who have been kind and generous, I am thankful for. God bless them all for their ministering to someone so undeserving and unable to ever repay them. And now, the grievous cost of my sin is not cost on me, Your Honor, but in daily reminders of its weightiness, nor is the grace and leniency I have been shown. I am at once the vilest offender, yet brought to completely broken repentance and no longer my own. By God's grace, I am saved, in Christ forgiven, and though unworthy, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Okay, I'm landing for the mayor. Council, I'm inclined to uh, follow the uh, negotiated disposition. Mr. Smith, I'll hear your comments. Mr. Smith, Mr. Campbell. I'll also submit your honor. Ms. Herrera. Submit your honor. Circumstances of mitigation are a defendant has no prior record of criminal conduct. Circumstances and aggravation are none. The defendant does qualify for punishment in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation based on the current offense. The defendant is statutorily ineligible for a grant of felony probation except in unusual circumstances, pursuant to Penal Code Section 1203 E, 2, and 3, and that he used a deadly weapon to wit a firearm upon the victim and inflicted great bodily injury to wit death. Upon review of Court 4.413, this case will not be cited as unusual. Even if found eligible, the defendant would not be considered a suitable candidate for a grant of felony probation based on this case due to the egregious nature of the crime the defendant shot and killed the victim and has felt that a prison sentence is the most appropriate consequence in this case and will be ordered. Pursuant to the plea agreement, it will be ordered that the defendant serve 25 years, 4 months in prison. It is noted any PC 654 issue is being waived pursuant to Rule of Court 4.412 sub B. As a result, the defendant will be sentenced as follows. As to count to a violation of Penal Code Section 192A, Probation will be denied and the defendant will be sent to the Department of Corrections for the upper term of 11 years. That sentence to be enhanced by 10 years pursuant to Section 12022.5 of the Penal Code. The defendant will be restitution pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.4F, an amount to be determined by the Probation Department at the direction of the court to the family of Robert Lamone for related losses. The defendant will be ordered to pay restitution in an amount to be determined by the probation department at the direction of the court to the restitution fund pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.4F2 for victim compensation and government claims board reimbursement to the family of the victim. There will be a fee in amount of $40 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1465.8 and a fee in amount of $30 pursuant to Government Code Section 70373. As to count three, a violation of Penal Code Section 664-187A, probation will be denied and the defendant will be sent to the Department of Corrections for the term of two years, four months, which is one-third of the midterm. That sentence will be served consecutive to the sentence imposed above. There will be a fee in the amount of $40 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1465.8 and $30 pursuant to Government Code Section 70373. As to count four, a violation of Penal Code Section 347A1, probation will be denied and the defendant will be sent to the Department of Corrections for the term of 16 months, which is one third of the midterm. That sentence will be served consecutive to the sentence opposed above. There will be a fee of $40 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1465.8 and $30 pursuant to Government Code Section 70373. As to count five, a violation of Penal Code Section 32, probation will be denied and the defendant will be sent to the Department of Corrections for the term of eight months, which is one-third of the midterm. That sentence to be served consecutive to the sentence imposed above for a total fixed term of 25 years, four months. Ms. Herrera, that's at 85% uh, correct. Yes, Your Honor. 
defendant will pay a fee in the amount of $40 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1465.8 and $30 pursuant to Government Code Section 70373. There will be a restitution fine in the amount of $300 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.4b. There will be a restitution fine in the amount of $300 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.45. And that fine is suspended subject to parole or post-release supervision revocation proceedings. Mr. Rare, updated custody credit, please. 1,095 actual, 164 good work, for a total of 1,259. Do you agree with that, Mr. Campbell? I'll submit it, Your Honor. I don't have any information to the contrary. Mr. Campbell, anything further at this time? No, thank you. Mr. Smith? No, Your Honor, thank you. Mr. Rare? No, Your Honor, thank you. Defense for men to the Department of Corrections. We're adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor.